All right. Welcome to the Chaos and Light podcast. I am your host, Angela Levesque, and today we have a special edition of the show. I am interviewing my dear friend, mentor, and the co-founder of the Chaos and Light community, Lisa martin Namey. Uh, if you've been to our site recently, you may have noticed there's a series of three articles on timeline collapse, which I think is incredibly cool. Uh, now, time travel and timelines have shown up in a lot of TV and movies lately. Um, I just watched a show called Travelers on Netflix, which was really cool, where they send a consciousness back in time to save humanity, actually many consciousnesses back in uh, in time to save humanity. And it's a great show. It's not really uh, exactly how it works, <laughs> but um, I think that anything having to I don't know, bring these concepts into our culture, I think, is very welcomed from my point of view. Um, so today we are going to talk about what a timeline is, timeline jumps, collapses, what they really represent, and I hope we might get into uh, a conversation about the void as it relates to timelines. So we will get to all of that. Uh, I just want to remind um, my listeners that the uh, Chaos and Light podcast is an integral part of our Chaos and Light community, uh, where we are doing incredibly cool stuff. Um, really, just it's a community for spiritual seekers to come and dive into topics of spiritual development and uh, consciousness expansion and just anything that's really related to um, our spiritual core. And so if you haven't checked it out, please go ahead at chaosandlight.com. And uh, yeah, so let's get to the, the show. I want to introduce Lisa first. Lisa has explored Ascended Mastery, uh, guided by her higher self, Ascended Master Guides, and the Sophia. <clears throat> Pardon me. She has lived and channeled information, processes, rituals, and ceremonies related to ascension and beyond. Her experiences include navigation of ascension, descension, the void, the light, the dark. Uh, those experiences have continued through the corridor and threshold of ascended mastery. She has been offering energy healing and intuitive guidance since 2009. Well, Welcome to the Chaos and Light podcast. How are you doing today? <laughs> Thank you, Angela. I am well. I am excited about our discussion today. I am very excited. Uh, do you agree with me that this idea, like, do you get excited when you see uh, stuff about spirituality and consciousness and expansion? Do you think that that's a good thing, even if it's somewhat misportrayed by pop popular culture? Absolutely. I, that's the stuff I want to watch. Like, I don't want to watch anything else <laughs> or read anything else. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I love watching that stuff. And I think it's really fun and interesting to see all these different perspectives, even if it's really different from how I see things or experience the universe or reality. Um, I always think it's interesting and I usually, you know, learn something or at least can find a new way to think about it. The one thing that I think is the tiny, tiny drawback is that like, even for example, like the portrayal of disincarnates or ghosts, right? Mm -hmm. They kind of expect that they're going to have like the moment, like in the, the movie ghost where you see it right in front of you and you have like this apparition. And, and then <laughs> when people kind of, you know, when they go see, you know, psychic, psychic mediums and such, and they realize that, you know, that, that, that doesn't really happen. That's not usually how they communicate. I think it kind of sets them up for, um, an experience that is much more, uh, like outwardly visual than most of the stuff is like most of the stuff is inner sight, not outer sight. Yes. Yes, I agree. And, um, when I was first awakening, uh, or really, yeah, we'll call it awakening, but really, uh, tuning into my psychic senses turning on, um, primarily I was a feeler and really I still am. That's still the primary way that I perceive information is through feeling. And so I thought I was like a second rate psychic um, because I didn't really see things and I wasn't very visual at that time. And that's, that's changed. I've developed that as a skill set. 
Um, but I, it really kind of Hollywood kind of played into that as well as some books that I had read and that like being clairvoyant was where it's at and was the primary way to do it. And everything else fell in line behind that. And um, my experiences have, you know, completely changed my opinion about that. And so now I know it doesn't matter how it comes to you. It just gets to you via the path of least resistance. And the way it comes to you is right for you. So it doesn't matter. Yes, I agree. Because I kind of wanted to set that up a little bit so that when we talk about this idea of timelines that people, you know, kind of have a... Uh, I guess, manage their expectations on, Mm. like, we're not like having that experience, you know, in a Dr. Strange where they're like flying through and there's all of these like psychedelic (laughs) things and things are whipping by them and no. So, well, that's cool too. Yeah, that is cool. That is my favorite Marvel (laughs) movie, to be honest. Okay. So let's start really basic. What is a timeline? So a timeline um, is just like a linear experience of events and in a linear sequence. And so that's the most basic explanation that I have or description. And then, then we have like feelings and perceptions and emotions and maybe even judgments about those experiences that we have in that linear perception uh, of experience. And that's really all that it is. And so is this something that is internal to the individual or, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, like my husband and I, we share space and some of our experiences follow a linear path, both, you know, we, we have those, those shared, um, experiences. So is that, is, is my timeline separate than his timeline or are we, do we each have our own? I think it's yes and no. That's a really great question. I've never thought of it that way, but you know, I do, uh, I do believe that we have both um, individual timelines as well as collective timelines and that whatever that defines that collective group, like that can be very amorphous. I don't know if I use that word correctly, but um, so it could mean, you know, like your biological family or, you know, the family that you create when you get married and have a child or children, or it could mean like all of uh, earth humans as a whole. And so I think there are just kind of, you know, thinking through what the possibilities would be. There are probably, um, all of the above. I think it's one of those putting your words, both and situations. And so when we talk about timelines, is that the same thing as parallel realities? Well, I'm not a theoretical physicist, but (laughs) I think that (laughs) from my perspective as a mystic, um, I would say, yeah, they're probably pretty much the same thing. And, uh, but I do think that, you know, we can experience those parallel realities in different ways. I think that, um, and, you know, maybe some of the listeners have become aware of themselves this way, but I think that, you know, sometimes we can be aware of ourselves, like uh, in the same body, kind of with the same basic circumstances around us, but some things are just slightly different. So we could be aware of that kind of parallel reality, but also I think we could consider like other incarnations where we look completely different and it's in a completely different space time point in the universe. Um, Like those theoretically could be considered timelines as well, or uh, excuse me, parallel realities as well. Hmm. Very interesting. As you're saying this, and I don't know, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, this idea of being in time and no time, that in order to sometimes experience those uh, maybe other parallel realities, if we use that word, that we often need to bring this current moment, our current self into no time in order to feel out into other um, timelines. Is that how you would describe it? Hmm. Well, that is a really interesting way to put it. Uh, that certainly would uh, might g- give you more agency or choice, um, thinking of it that way. So I hadn't quite thought of it that way. 
Um, the way that I would explain being in no time versus being in a timeline or like, you know, why would I want to do that? Um, is, uh, so what I noticed when I had this experience recently is, um, that, um, being in a timeline, I was, um, almost confined and uh, it's like, um, you know, wherever I held judgments um, or allowed myself to be emotionally hooked by whatever stories are going on, either my own personal stories, past, present or future or collective stories, past, present, present or future, um, like that timeline you know, also represented where I was hooked in emotionally to those stories or had formed judgments about them. And so in the moments that I pop out of a timeline, that is like a moment when I'm able to either consciously or unconsciously unhook myself from all of those stories and pull my emotions back into your, my body and or, or both and, um, uh, move into neutrality regarding my judgments. And so it's that space of neutrality where you know, we're unhooked and you know, we're, we have agency over our emotions again. Um, like that is the space of no time. And so like, I'm still exploring really, you know, what does that mean? Like what kind of, um, how does that change my experience of, you know, I'm still living in this human body and, you know, operating with this brain and mind. Um, So that part, I don't know quite yet, (laughs) Um, but uh, I think I got lost my train of thought there a little bit, but. um, (laughs) Well, again, as you're saying this, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot in a lot of things, but as stuff is dropping in, I'm like, okay, we need to talk about this. Okay. It kind of occurs to me that this idea, when you're talking about getting hooked, getting hooked into mm-hmm. stories, and, I, and I've heard you describe this kind of before, you've seen yourself standing there and you can see all of these different stories and like trauma and all of that stuff kind of like whirling around you. And it occurs to me that maybe our perception of kind of linear time is the story, is the story because we are in a in a way kind of like pushing that forward by getting hooked into these stories and that kind of creates this this perception that this that these timelines or that just time in general is moving from point A to point B to point C and that if we unhook like you said from those stories then then there's nothing like propelling or pushing forward those timelines am yes. I blowing am I blowing your mind yes. right now because you I'm- are blowing my mind I'm like Fuck. I never thought of that either <laughs> so like who's the uh anyways um I think that um you know as I said I'm you know I'm still kind of living into this question and exploring it and I might be doing so for the rest of my life but um I uh First of all, you mentioned kind of the stories that are spinning around us. So I think that I've noticed that there is a kind of a bird's eye view of a timeline, which, you know, from a mystical viewpoint or or maybe a clairvoyant viewpoint, um, you know, we can sometimes see those lines stretching out either underneath us or before us kind of stretching out into the future. So that's like the outside view but when we're in the timeline, we have, may have these moments where we become clear on, um, oh, God, oh gosh, I don't know, what we're becoming, anyway, we're developing some sort of clarity and um, moving from maybe a state of unconsciousness into conscious awareness. And so, yeah, so from inside the timeline, that same phenomenon looks like this, tor- it looks to me like a tornado of all of these stories spinning around us and the stories want to hook your attention and your attention also contains your emotional energy. And so they want, the stories want it so that they can continue to exist. And so when we disconnect, then we like take our fuel or the fuel that we were adding to that story 
we take it out of there. So it becomes a little less emotionally charged, the story does. And then we also then become less emotionally charged as well. I think here is a good uh, moment to take a very short break. And when we get back, I want to make this a little bit more uh, personal and real. And we're going to, I'm going to get Lisa to share her story about um, choosing, about her experiences with choosing timelines and not choosing timelines. So we'll discuss that when we get back. Do you need more spiritual sustenance in your daily life? Check out chaosandlight.com, where new articles, blogs, meditations are added weekly. Chaosandlight.com, a playground for mind, mystery, and human potential. Hello, I um, we are talking to Lisa Martin Namy uh, about the topic of timelines. So this uh, became relevant recently when you wrote those three articles because uh, once again, um, this idea of either uh, choosing a different timeline, or in this case, uh, not choosing a timeline, showed up for you. So let's start um, with one. How how do you know when you have, um, I guess, chosen a different timeline? Is that the right way to ex- explain it? Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, it can show up in a variety of ways, but I personally notice it Um, when mundane things in my environment suddenly are different. So this particular time, it showed up as my debit card and dryer sheets, (laughs) which are two totally mundane things, right? So my my, uh, debit card, I was at the grocery store using it, and it just looked different. Like I didn't remember it looking the way it looked. Like it had a lot more color on it this time as it's a white card. And so it was it just had more color on it than I remembered. And so I was like, does that look like that? And I checked my wallet to make sure I'd pulled out the right card, but I only have one white card. So it was the right card. And I was just like, well, that's really weird. So I put the card back, you know, in my wallet and I go home and I get home and I'm taking the, I'm packing the groceries and my husband comes out from the bedroom and he wants to eat me to smell a shirt because he thinks it smells strange. And so I smelled it and he asked me if I changed our laundry detergent. And I said, no, I haven't changed the laundry detergent. And he's like, well, why does it smell like that? And I'm like, I, I have no idea, but I do you know, agree. It does smell different than any other laundry. I don't know why it smells like that. So then I went into the laundry room a little while later to put something in the dryer. And I opened up these dryer sheets that I buy for him because they have a manly smell (laughs) or manly scent. (laughs) um, I opened up the box and there was the smell, the aroma that was on his shirt. And now I bought this box of uh, dryer sheets months ago. And I only use them once in a while with like stuff that's been worn really hard. (laughs) And I want to make sure it smells nice, right? So I only use them once in a while. So I open up the box and there's this strange scent they don't recognize. And um, then I close the box and I read the scent and I was like, this is not the right scent. Like this is not what I bought. And I have been using that other scent and now it's changed. And like, in that moment with those two events, the debit card and the dryer sheets, then that just clued into my consciousness that I had just shifted time timelines. Like something was changing with my timelines. And, um, and so then I just had to explore, you know, exactly what is going on. Okay. So you have had this happen before. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, previous times and what you decided to do, or do you want to jump into to what uh, what happened? This sure, time? sure. So, just briefly, previous times I would find myself. Sometimes I was already in another timeline, and I had just noticed, kind of past tense, that a shift had happened, and I was already on my way in another linear experience. Um, but lately, it's been more like I noticed that. I'm not in any timeline. I'm just hanging out in the void. And in previous experiences, 
I thought, well, I have to be in a timeline. So it was kind of like a scary moment. And so I, you know, quickly grasped at another one and plunked myself in something. And so, um, so this time I it was actually my higher self that stopped me. I was in the middle of a texting chat with a friend and, um, you know, my, all my friends kind of have these kinds of experiences that you and I have, Angela. And so she was able to track with me. And um, so I told her what was going on. And she suggested that I just asked to be guided to into the timeline that was for my highest good or something like that. And so I was like, okay, cool. That sounds great. So as I'm reading her text, like I can feel one of the timelines on my right. And there were many, like there were more than I could assess in, in a, you know, that split second, but I can feel one of them on my right of magnetically pulling me in. And then inside myself, I heard a voice that just said, stop. And that of course was my higher self and my higher self informed me that I had a choice to make right now and that I could choose to continue on in a timeline or I could unhook and just be in a state of, well, basically liberation would be the best way to describe it. But also in that liberation where we encounter a, um, a state of consciousness that is known as neutrality or divine neutrality, which is another way that I w um, describe divine love or universal love. So it was a moment for me to be free of that and then to maintain that moment and extend it. So that's what I chose. So that seemed like the most exciting choice. So if we, you know, bring that around to that idea of the like tornadoes swirling stories, does that mean that you are not getting hooked by those stories? Yes. Well, it's something that uh, as I have moved forward from that moment in quote unquote time, having that experience, <clears throat> um, uh, what I have noticed is that it's something that I have to keep choosing over and over and over again. So um, like um, situations or experiences have continued to arise that are offering me the potential to plug in to those experiences and take that kind of emotional tumultuous ride on, um, and, you know, getting, uh, I don't know, kind of, um, Oh gosh, kind of bounded into a single lane of experience might be another way to say it. So um, it's been a real exercise for me to uh, continue to come back to this place of divine neutrality. Sometimes it's been very easy for me to, you know, use just one of my many tools to do that. And other times it's been extremely challenging, especially when the event feels like, you know, something really personal or like a personal attack or something like those are the most challenging. Um, but I'm looking at those experiences as just as challenges um, that enable me to strengthen this new skill set of remaining in this state of divine neutrality. Because that is where we really have full agency over our choices and our emotions and what we want to manifest and what we want to lend our energy to. Uh, like that seems to me like really the place to be. So I want to talk a little bit about you had mentioned that you use the term divine neutrality. So when I hear that, I think about the way that you just described it, that um, we're not getting hooked into it. We're not sending um, our emotional uh, energy. We're not making these investments in these stories that then again come back to us and we create that kind of swirling tornado. Is So for you to say that that experience, and that really makes sense to me, this idea of divine neutrality, and uh, I almost liken it in you know, being able to step back in meditation, the idea of being able to, the difference between uh, I am angry and, oh, this is anger. Like seeing yes. that that is, oh, you're, you're separated, you're detached enough that you understand it when you see it and yet you don't have to own it or claim it. So 
at what point, so that makes sense when I hear divine neutrality, but you use that as synony- synonymous with um, divine love. Can you explain? Um, it's one of the main uh, yoga texts, um, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. There we go. So that's where I read this was in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And it mentioned... Um, Oh, talking about uh, the power of discernment. So, um, so discernment is like one of the basic powers of um, becoming an empowered person who um, has agency over, you know, what they, how their life manifests or what they manifest in life. And also giving the person agency over, um, um, moving through uh, the process of ascension and into enlightenment and spiritual development, etc. So one of the keys of um, developing this skill set of discernment or the power of discernment is having the ability to move into the state of neutrality. And um, then I think I just saw psychically or received as a download that the when I was in able to achieve that neutral moment, and then in the beginning, it was just a moment that I was able to maintain that. Then it also just totally opened up my energy field, um, especially the core, like the pranic core of my energy field, and enabled me to connect the universal love, so the love that is all around us all the time, and connect it with. Um, the, that same spark of love inside me, which uh, I think of as our I am presence, which resides in the core, uh, excuse me, the sacred heart, which is tucked behind the core heart. Um, and so in those moments, then the universal love outside of us and that spark of divine love that's inside of us is the I am presence. They're able to connect. Um, but first, the energy field needs to relax and open up. And so you know, we need to be unhooked emotionally and mentally and, you know, in a state of relaxation and receptivity to be able to have that experience. So it just came to me um, as as you're explaining that, that the reason that divine neutrality and divine love are the same is because our natural state is love. Mm, that's beautiful. And so when we're not in story, when we're not in judgment, when we're not, um, you know, in that wanting place of, you know, satisfying desire and that sort of thing, our natural place is love, which is essentially a neutral space. It is. Yes. Um, the other thing I wanted to follow up on is you've talked, you've asked me a couple of times now about our emotions being hooked into these stories that, and the, that are either are the uh, timelines or are encapsulated by the timelines. So, um, you know, along the lines of developing this divine neutrality and uh, this discernment and this being in this place of no time, like mastering our ability to kind of um, manipulate our own emotions or, you know, utilize them for our own purposes, hopefully for the good of all, right? Uh, But uh, (laughs) I think that's the the key point there um, is that our emotions actually are a key in fueling our own life force energy. So when they're hooked and being spent in other places, and then that is a, um, like a leak on our own life force energy or, you know, uh, feeding on that. It's, it's dwindling. But when we're able to reclaim that energetic portion of ourselves, then almost automatically um, that energy begins to do what it's intended to do. And that is to fuel our own life force. And so, you know, who knows where we can go with that? You know, um, that's another exploration Yes. And as long as it doesn't come from a place, you know, cause I, I am a, I figure that I'm a pretty joyful person. Um, you people are. <laughs> have likened me to, um, to Labrador retrievers, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I gratefully and graciously accept that comparison. Um, but I, 
I wonder, like, when you think about being in this place, like, I, I know how joy fuels my life force energy, but I don't always feel joyful. You know, sometimes I feel uh, sad and angry and depressed and I'm getting caught up in those timelines. So how do we, um, without spiritually bypassing, how do we spend more time in those states of bliss and joy and, and, you know, all the gratitude, those, those happier emotions? Practice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I guess, you know, <laughs> for me, because of uh, my kind of grounded, I'm so grounded in the divine masculine, using things like meditation is very valuable because like I, I explained before, that idea of divine neutrality and being able to um, uh, be unattached but from the stories, which is something that you, that you practice in certain yes. types of med- meditation, that that to me makes it much easier. So I'm able to witness the stories in other people so much easier because I started to witness them within myself. So it allows me to have a lot more compassion for myself. It has, you know, more compassion for other people. And I don't, you know, I can just be like, they might just be having a bad day or they're going through a hard time. And uh, I find that judgment, going into judgment, which is something that I continually work on, and I'm a work in progress on that, that judgment particularly is one of those things that um, just is such a power leak for me, such an energy leak, and I can feel mm-hmm. that. So yes, practice for me and my particular practice to to move into that space is is meditation. What about for you? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I there are... I think there are probably infinite ways that we could go about doing this, like going outside and being in nature or spending time with animals or spending time with a close loved one, like maybe a ch- somebody that we love. Um, you know, these are all like really um, grounded, practical ways to practice being in that state of neutrality. Um, but certainly, uh, meditation or, um, you know, sometimes meditation, I think classically meditation is, um, really considered, um, going into the state of no mind, um, which is actually really, really challenging for most people, um, and takes a lot of work to get there, you know, so what do you do in the meantime? So, um, uh, there's some really great, um, you know, energetic ways that we could do this, which is really, just a way of kind of uh, channeling the power of your mind, um, utilizing your imagination, your intention, and your will to shift your state of consciousness is really all that energy work is, whether you're doing that for yourself or if you have developed the ability or have the gift to do that for other people. Um, So one way that we can do that, and I always recommend starting here, is just getting grounded. And so um, you can either drop a cord into the earth or my favorite way of grounding um, lately has been to just open up the bottom of my energy field and allow the earth energy to rise up into me so it like meets me where I am. And every time I've done this or that I've shared this with somebody else and guided them in how to do this, um, every time I do this, it instantly, without me having to do anything or, you know, do any special tricks or anything or procedures, instantly raises my frequency. And like, I can feel tension and density lifting out of my body, almost like, like bubbles out of a, you know, soda pop bottle or something. It just, it becomes effervescent and it just lifts me right up. um, And like bumps up my, my vibration to the next octave. Um, So that's one way with that we can start. And then we might notice that um, kind of above our heads, we might be able to feel like a lot of congestion or a lot of movement up there. Um, or it can feel like uh, we can just be aware that there are lots of thoughts going on and lots of chatter. And it's kind of hard to organize our thoughts or get ourselves to calm down. So that's kind of 
a clue that, you know, maybe you're out of your body or not fully in your body. And um, it, when we're in that state, it also kind of blocks our energy field and our product core from being able to open up and have that connection of that universal energy coming in and connecting with the um, love energy in our hearts. Um, so one thing that we can do is just, again, using your imagination and your will and your intention is to start pulling all those arms of energy back into you one at a time. And as you do that, meanwhile, you have the earth energy coming up to shift your frequency before you know it, everything just relaxes. Like your whole body starts to relax and you might even release some pain and all the mental mind chatter just starts to calm down. And like you'll like this, the feeling is unmistakable. Like you'll know it when, when you reach that point. And it's, it's not that hard. It's not for only advanced mystical, clairvoyant, psychic people, like we all have the ability to practice this and do this and have this experience. I absolutely agree. Well, let's take another really, really short break. When we get back, we'll just um, wrap up this conversation talking about the void, which is also a really fascinating topic. And uh, yeah, so we'll be right back. Are you enjoying this podcast? and want to help this lady out? Well, share it with friends, or even better, leave a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. Now back to the show. Well, as the uh, really nice lady told you in the, <laughs> in the little break there, if you do like this type of conversation, please go to iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast and uh, just give us a review. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you have thoughts. I'm not really on social media these days. So if you want to join the conversation, you can send me an email at Angela at chaosandlight.com or you could join us in the community because we talk about this cool shit all the time. All right. So here in the last few minutes, uh, I want to talk um, first, if you could introduce the topic of the void and then maybe just explain how the void relates to timelines. Okay. Uh, so the, the void. So the void is essentially this place, this space, this container of this divine neutrality. And other ways that I understand the void are um, that it's the place that contains the divine will, or it is divine will. It's also the divine feminine component or principle of the universal energies. Um, and uh, it's a, a place, I think I already said surrender, but it's a, like, that is the main lesson of the void is it's a place where we can just relax where we can let go and um, where we don't need to uh, have it all figured out. We can just let it come, it being life or experiences or uh, let that come to us as they are. And it's also a place um, where like all potential, all potential possibility exists. And um, so it's a place where we actually can see how many choices we have because the, all the choices are there that are available to us. Um, so, uh, so that's the void and how it relates to um, how it relates to timelines is it's also the place where we can experience this concept of no time of being free from any timeline. So is it uh, sometimes I describe it as, uh, the kind of the primordial matter. So it's the place of like unmanifested consciousness. And then you have the masculine yes. that comes in and provides the structure um, or the yes. form for the, the divine feminine principle. Yes, I would agree. Yeah, I like that. And so how do you move into the void? Um, well, uh the way that we move into the void is <laughs> um, there are a lot of different ways. Again, there are infinite ways. And part of my experience, my mystical experience has been 
like discovering different ways that I can keep coming back to that same state of neutrality. Um, so one of my uh, a favorite way that I just recently discovered as I was uh, training myself how to um, move out of states of judgment within myself is I stumbled upon this Buddhist mantra, Tibetan Buddhist mantra, and the mantra is Om Ah Hum. And so if you look that up on the internet, um, there are, there's a little training, several different Buddhist teachers offer a short training on um, how to really get into that um, and kind of attune yourself to that frequency that that mantra offers. Um, but, uh, what I do with it is, um, I will just sit with my eyes closed and, um, I will, uh, bring up, well, first, I guess I have my eyes open cause I'm looking at the, <laughs> the three Tibetan symbols. So, um, so I'll envision the symbol for Om in my third eye in the color white. And while I'm saying Om either silently or I'm chanting. And then you move into the syllable whom, H-U-M. And then there's a red symbol that you see in your throat chakra for that. And then, um, I'm sorry, oh, ah is the second syllable. Sorry, it's om and then ah. And then whom is the third syllable that you see in blue. So um, that's a really practical way. If you practice that mantra over and over again with that visualization, um, it takes a little bit of practice and honestly, I'm still practicing it, uh, but pretty quickly it will shift you into that state of neutrality, um, which is also a void state. Well, I think that that's a great place to leave this conversation because usually this last segment here is it's worth your time. So I think that, uh, I know you have a YouTube video that you like that takes you through that. Um, that's a, the chanting of that. It's uh, the YouTube video is uh, a record a professional singer just singing it. Um, but what we can do is, you know, leave that in the comments as well as um, my a link to one of the Buddhist teachings on oh. how to implement the. Yes, well, I think that's fantastic. <laughs> we'll include those in the show notes as resources for you. Well, uh, Lisa. I hope to have you on the show again. I would love to have you do the the dark, the light, and the void. Go really deep into that, or there's like a million things that we could talk about. Um, if you haven't checked out uh, the Chaos and Light website, you should go. We have all sorts of meditations and articles, and she we have three articles there on timelines specifically. Uh, yeah, we're just putting new stuff up all the time, even for those who aren't members. There's a whole... Uh, portion of our site that is just free for checking out. So go ahead and do that at chaosandlight.com. And Lisa, thank you for being on today. Thank you, Angela. Yes. And yeah, we will be back next week with, um, I don't know, some other cool topic. Well, that's the show for today. Take care and seek the mystery.